Okay, all right, all right. Well, we'll get that to the Okay, everybody. Are you ready to uh, watch the conclusions of the uh, big jam here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome, everybody, attendees, guests, judges, sponsors, uh, to the conclusion of the Startup Weekend uh, Talk Data Jam. Uh, my name is Jim Van Fleet. Hey, uh, oh, the cat's still on. <laughs> Thank you. Very professional organization here, as you can see. Uh, it's a team member. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Um, so uh, I'm Jim Green Lee. Uh, I'm in uh, from Charlotte, where I've been a participant and uh, organizing team uh, for Startup Weekend just kind of from the beginning there. Uh, I love the event. It's a great way to get involved with uh, really interesting, dynamic people. And so uh, now I'm kind of available to come around in the Carolinas and uh, facilitate them when they pop up. Uh, I'm also uh, the Code for Charlotte uh, Brigade Captain. Code for Charlotte is part of Code for America. Uh, it's a uh, national organization dedicated to uh, open data, open source, open government. And so uh, I'm really just learning a lot about uh, open data very early on in my uh, lifetime of uh, appreciation for that. And so it's been really interesting to see so many people here with uh, kind of longer histories and more experience uh, working with it. That's been really inspiring. And uh, I'm really excited to see the presentations tonight, so I'm not going to speak a little bit. Um, and then I've done various other uh, bits of uh, uh, organization uh, around Charlotte, trying to make it a good place to be for tech people and entrepreneurs. Um, Startup Weekend at this point is a massive undertaking. Thousands of events, hundreds of thousands of attendees uh, all across the world. Um, that's possible through support from uh, the national sponsors, uh, American Express, Sprint, Posted. Uh, Startup Weekend is a global undertaking. It has global sponsors from around the world. Uh, Amazon and Google both give uh, credits to developers. Co gives them out the domain names. And Coca-Cola has uh, had Coke products in the fridge all weekend. Seems to be drinking. Um, so uh, these events wouldn't be possible without a local organizing team. And this organizing team has done an incredible job. So if you're on an organizing team, would you raise your hands? And everybody else, give them a round of applause. <laughs>
So this year is going to bring North Carolina in second data for Lewis. Data for Lewis is going to bring open data in North Carolina, data from liberated federal, state, local data, brought it here to Data Jam. This is really the starting point. All the teams that come out of Data Jam are eligible to compete in Data for Lewis in September with a big Data for Lewis surprise. Data for Lewis is going to be a bigger, broader event. This event was really focused on you, the innovators, people that at the time to make things happen and you can take it out of Data Jam and build something over the summer. Data Blues is going to pull in people that are interested, whether it's from a policy perspective, a business perspective, investment perspective, open data, come and really celebrate open data, what's happening, and what you've been able to build. So thanks for coming out this weekend. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody this weekend. Thanks a bunch. Sure, my name is Reed. I uh, work for Socrata. Uh, we are a proud sponsor this year. Uh, we have been providing an open data portal for all the attendees and the groups out there. So I encourage you to check out the portal where a lot of the groups are using uh, government data that are provided by uh, municipal governments like uh, Wake County, North Carolina. And again, we're just glad to be here. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, I'll touch briefly on the rest of the local sponsors. Uh, Blackstone Entrepreneurs Network, who I think is here at HQ as well, they uh, provide uh, mentorship benefits to uh, startups and innovative practices uh, in the area, uh, and they've provided uh, financial support so thanks to Blackstone. Innovate Raleigh is a nonprofit uh, driven to making the Triangle area one of the uh, top five for entrepreneurship in the country. Uh, Patagonia Health is a uh, health uh, provider and uh, software solutions uh, provider, and it's also providing one of our judges tonight. Um, and Wind Street Institute Solutions has been a uh, longtime supporter of uh, entrepreneurial uh, events and success uh, since the days they were hosting solutions. Uh, we also have Triangle Business Law. They'll be providing uh, any kind of uh, prizes uh, for uh, our winners this evening. Uh, DX Lab provided uh, coaching and will also be providing mentorship to some of the winners. And Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina has uh, helped by making sure that its employees were uh, aware of the event as well as providing some volunteer help for registration. Um, so, our teams tonight are going to be competing for three different prizes. The top prize includes three months of co-working here in this space. Um, so, kind of like a, a nice membership here for those of you who it's your first time. I'm sure you'll enjoy coming back. Uh, and a spot in the finals at Data Palooza. Uh, start startup weekend, uh, for various reasons, will never offer cash prizes. And so it's really uh, exciting to see a partnership with another uh, local event that's going to be able to, uh, to do that. So uh, a really exciting opportunity for our winner tonight. Uh, the top three contestants will all receive some kind of space at HQ. Uh, the uh, first runner-up will receive that same three months of co-working. The third place finisher will be able to schedule meetings here. Uh, and then uh, all three top finishers will have uh, legal consultation from Triangle Business Law and uh, UX consulting from DX Labs uh, upstairs. Uh, so uh, the team that will be responsible for uh, determining which of you uh, are in the top three, uh, we have it over here to our right. Reference sheet. And uh, as I call your name, please raise your hand. Uh, Jason Burke, Senior Advisor and Faculty at UNC Healthcare and School of Medicine. Chris Buer, Director of Innovation and Product Management at MedFusion. Wayne Fulgham, Assistant Director, Venture Direct Development, Office of Tech Transfer at NC State University. Sonali Lunia, Vice President of Customer Experience at Patagonia Health. John Hoonan, Director, Product Engineering, Quintiles and Vasaria, and Miles Wright, CEO at, you, did, you just told me this, uh, Xanify. All ah, right, I got it. <laughs> I'm 
famous for going over and asking and then still getting it wrong. So, good to see you. <laughs> when it gets typed in at least one way tonight. Right. Um, so, uh, the judging criteria, this is what they've been uh, informed of as the kind of the organizers have worked with the usual uh, kind of startup weekend criteria, which is all around uh, business formation. We recognize that some of the things that we might see tonight are really about improving health outcomes, whether they're policy directed or something else. So uh, we, we're concerned about the impact. Uh, what kind of impact can this have on health outcomes, whether that's economic or in increased lifespans? Uh, execution, how much did you actually get done in the week? Uh, the weekend, uh, user experience and its design, how well does that solution interface with other people? Can you explain it easily? Uh, and the use of open data, uh, which is uh, kind of what brought us together for the weekend. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the, uh, the framing for the health data jam. Uh, now I'm going to go over some of the details uh, about our teams coming up to present. Uh, we have an X uh, on the ground up here right about where I'm standing with these uh, lovely people over to your left. This is a, a kind of a suggested place for you to stand while you give your presentation. It will keep you kind of in a place where you can uh, look at this, you can look at the judges, you can look at the crowd, and there is a uh, timing monitor right here on the iPad which is going to keep you alert of your time. Uh, there is going to be seven minutes per presentation uh, with another three minutes for Q&A. Uh, and uh, please be aware of where your team is. Uh, all teams are going to be alerted by me as I'm kind of doing some of the MC and rotation about whether you're going to be on deck or not. If I tell you that you're on deck, please kind of bring whoever's going to be involved in the presentation kind of like up towards the front, have the, have the notebook available. Uh, it's really noticeable when we spend a lot of time flipping in the machines and stuff like that. So um, uh, just try to be ready, and uh, we'll make this the best show that we can uh, that we can get tonight. So is everybody ready to actually see some of these things? <laughs> well, uh, our first team is going to be called Fire. So let's bring them on up. I'll get into the class. All right, uh, good afternoon. We are Health Bite. Uh, I'd like to introduce my team. Uh, this is Slay, uh, Kurt Schetzler, and Maria Remington. Uh, we're building an app to help allergy sufferers and their families. Uh, first off, food allergies in the United States are a big issue right now. Uh, every three minutes, food allergy sends someone to the ER. Uh, we're finding that there's an increase as well, 50% increase in children from 1997 to 2001, and that trend seems to continue to climb. 90% of all food allergy visits to the ER are because of a 
very limited for foods. Um, you can see those, those listed right there. Uh, we have a very simple solution for that. You build a profile on our app that contains the, the items that you're most allergic to. Go to the store, a simple UPC code scan lets you know with a thumbs up or thumbs down whether or not um, that food item is going to be an issue for you. Um, right now, I'd like to hand it over to Ian for a quick show of what the what the app itself looks like. Well, in the interest of uh, this not actually um, showing up on the big screen, to make this as big as I can. Um, now, this isn't going to be good for most people, but uh, this is not actually the app. We have playing the part of the app is this screen. Um, and what we're intending just to show with this is, is what we're doing with the data. We're both consuming and collecting data. I have here a profile uh, of the eight uh, top food allergens. I've got, I've got food selected already. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture a product code. Um, and here is my camera. I can stand playing the role of a pretzel bag. It's just a bag of cheetos. So I put that bag of cheetos up there. And it's straight down because um, we had issues, the, the genuine issues with, sc with scanning and the rotation and the shininess and everything with the bag. Um, but here it's come up uh, with my uh, bag of pretzels that it recognizes. Um, and wheat is there, it contains wheat. I've already checked wheat, it's there red. And it gives me a button that finds some alternatives. Um, so that's the first. It's, it's found the data from the UPC code and it's found uh, other. Alternatives I can try and find. And it's giving me one that doesn't contain wheat. Um, now, if I go back to the profile and if I select, yeah, I've also got a problem with soy. Now the soy becomes red and, and it gives me another button to go find more alternatives. So it's this kind of um, both the collection of data for the profile, um, the, the uh, cons consumption of external data for the product information and its ingredients, um, and then data handling within the app against what you can and cannot have, and the data that's been discussed. And then finally, if I can find my mouse again, the final one now no wheat, no soy, and that's something that you have. All right, uh, here's the rest of the uh, presentation is fired off too. So, um, one of the biggest aspects that we're proud of when it comes to this app is, you know, of course, the data collection on a couple of different sides. Um, first off, the data collection that's going to come from the users themselves uh, as far as what type of allergies they're allergic to, which we figure we push out to physicians, even the retailers themselves, so they can have some awareness of people in their region and what is most uh, problematic for. Uh, coupled with that, those users are also going to put in whether or not this is something that they're self regulating or for something they've been uh, clinic with that. Again, giving physicians in the area an idea of are people dealing with food allergies or are they just waiting until they go to the ER that first time? Um, the last element that we're also looking for from them is what specifically are they allergic to? Um, this allows any sort of scan needs that come in in the future as alternatives for those retailers. Uh, the second element that we're looking at is uh, 
the information that these users are collecting for each other uh, as far as alternatives. For instance, if you go in and you're looking for gluten-free pretzels and you locate an alternative for this, we'll build a database so that future users that are looking for gluten-free pretzels will be able to access that information. And essentially that database will create um, a viable resource for people to use so that they can maintain a reasonably healthy uh, uh, dietary uh, strategy. The best part about this and what we're really focusing on is if we can make this a uh, something that we can piggyback onto the grocery store system where they're already scanning every item that you use, um, your uh, loyalty card you can have your profile built in there with your uh, with your uh, allergens already located. So every item that's scanned is run against that that list. If there's anything that comes up as a possible uh, problem, you can be notified and receive be notified right there at the point of sale. And those grocery stores in the future can also um, send out maybe monthly emails saying, hey, this is what you bought. This might be a good alternative to make sure that your whole family is, is consistent with this, this allergy issue. Uh, we're running up against time, so uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions. I imagine there's going to be quite a few. <laughs> but let's, get, let's get you another minute. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, initially, how we're planning on building this community is by putting the app out uh, free to get as, as many people as possible um, with an ad-supported element to it. We're also planning on working with government-sponsored food initiatives so that uh, folks that are on a budget that are really working hard to maintain uh, a healthy eating standard can, can take advantage of it. We're also looking to specialize with or uh, partner with specialty retail stores that are likely to uh, want to give their customers a higher end benefit. Because um, obviously, this isn't just about allergies. This could be for paleo diets. This could be for vegan. This could be for uh, halal, kosher, whatever it means, any sort of food um, specific initiative that you're looking for, we can utilize. Um, our ideal customers, obviously, families with allergies. Kids, we really like the idea of kids being able to, at a, a friend's house, scan an item and immediately have feedback, yes or no, whether or not this item is going to cause any problems. Uh, foreign language speakers that might not uh, otherwise be able to read the ingredients. Teachers dealing with a lot of kids and any sort of first responders that may need to know what sort of allergies this person is presenting. Um, okay, I'll open the floor for any questions from anybody else. I'm going to my tech team back here at Marketing as well. I uh, need to call if anybody is better adjusted than I. Um, we went through quite a few of the, uh, the different categories as far as the, the health in the areas. Uh, Poverty level as it pertains to uh, hospitals in the area was really, really telling. Uh, we noticed that folks that were diagnosed with allergies goes up as your distance from the poverty line increases, which leads us to believe that it's not necessarily that, that people that are more affluent are, are more likely to be allergic, but that they're getting diagnosed because they're having routine visits. This is a way we can kind of cut around that system and perhaps get folks that might not have the opportunity for yearly physician visits to at least be recognized. And as we collect that data, we can show probably more appropriately what that what that strap looks like. One of the things we also noticed with the demographics is that a lot of the summaries of these uh, surveys um, were stating that uh, more wealthy individuals are, the more allergies they have. In specifically those words, and we said, well, that's, you know, it's pretty obvious to us that there's a gap there under report because the wealthy have more access to more diagnosis. In terms of official diagnosis, where it's a lot of lower income people are self diagnosing or self uh, regulating, self managing this. Um, so I think, I think to that point, although we may not be using this data uh, within the app, you know, it would be more certain to justify the existence of the virus direction, but the data we collect. Um, say out in the rural communities, uh, you know, uh, lower income families and individuals who are not showing up. Um, we're not saying the Ethiopian data that's available is incorrect, but it's just not you know, as accurate as it could be. And so we have the opportunity here to collect information from people's profiles, augment that, and let clinicians know out in the rural community who, if they check the data, there's nobody around so you can pass these food allergies, but that's. <laughs> 
So we are Team Stone Soup. Can you hear me? Sorry. Sam, can you hear me? I'm there. So we are Team Stone Soup. We are neighbors feeding neighbors. So thanks so much for coming out on a Sunday afternoon to this conversation. Our team is made up of myself and Kathy from Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina. We've got Bill Carter and Chris in the back there from Wake County. And then we've got Alicia Hardy, Bruce Lynch, and David Meisner, who are independent consultants helping us out here. So I'll start off with a story. So there's a famous folk tale called Stone Soup, also a book by Marshall Brown. It's about these soldiers. They come into a town. They're hungry, can't find food. And so they say, hey, let's make some stone soup, which is basically rocks and boiling water. And they use that as a catalyst to get the community together. People bring carrots, potatoes, meat, bread, whatever. And so the town is able to have this great feast based on the idea of stone soup. And because they all came together as a community, they're able to, to have a nice feast. So the tie into that is something called food insecurity. So according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, food insecurity is a percentage of the population who do not have a reliable access to food during the past year. We did some analysis and we found that this is highly correlated with health outcome and then it's something that can be addressed. So if we look at this chart here on the x-axis, we see the percent population of food insecure. That's the percent of people who, have, who say they have food insecure and they're not sure where the next meals can come from. And on the axis, on the y-axis, we see the health outcome ranking. This is the, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Again, it's a vetted, validated measure that ranks the counties. Number one county, Wake County, is on the top, and then the least uh, health outcome county is on the bottom. And so we see that as the percentage of population food insecure increases, we see that the ranking goes down. So it definitely has an impact on, on the health if people don't have access to food. And we looked at a number of different variables in our analysis that were available on the portal that were put together for this weekend. And this was a really strong thing that we found, but it's also something that can be acted on. Income is a problem, maybe that's a driver of negative health, but not as easily something you can address. Whereas something about food, you can easily, more easily get people food. And so this shows how it ranks in North Carolina. If you look across the counties, the range for food insecurity is about 11% for some counties, all the way up to 28%. The average is about 19% statewide. 19% statewide, that's slightly fewer than 2 million people from North Carolina alone. Have this issue. So this is a very important problem. It negatively impacts health, so it's something that, that definitely is worth addressing. So how do we solve this problem? Well, there's a little bit of a fragmented market. Okay, look at later. So we have a food bank on one side who are people who have food to give out. We've got people who need food, who are hungry, and then we have people who might have excess food. So those might be restaurants, bakeries, on a local level, maybe other um, members of the community who want to help donate to people who need the food. And our goal is to bring together these three groups. And just to point out, in America, there's 40% of food is actually thrown away. It's waste. So we know there's an excess of food. So we know that there's potential to bring these three groups together. So that brings us to our idea. Our idea is to create a platform to connect the donors, the food providers, and those in need okay, with, with the source of food very hyper-local, so not focusing on the whole national scale, focusing on community by community, where those in need can come and find help in their area, people who have food to donate can come and find donation opportunities, and then other people in the community can just come and donate or maybe find out where they might go to volunteer so they can help out. And with that, I'll give it over to Dave to talk about this site. Thanks, Tim, for giving you a brief intro to a prototype of our website. And so we saw there are sites out there that have some information on various food sources, but there was no nice aggregated site that made it easy for people to find food that's available close to them. So you see when the site loads, the first site is for someone who's in need of food. We'll make it very easy to re-enter it. We'll show you a personalized case that's food available near you. So I'm going to start with Scotland County, which had the highest food insecurity rate in North Carolina. And so what I see right here is a very personalized page which tells me not only what's available and where, but also when. So I see that I can get food today. As I scroll down, I can thumb my week and see what else is going to be available to me as the week goes on. And so we continue to iterate this to make it as easy to use as possible for people who need food as well as Social Security uh, workers who advise them. It's mobile friendly, and it's also a very scalable platform that once we populate it from one county, we can 
bring in a lot of data sets from other sites as well as working with the providers to make sure the data is updated and accurate. In addition to the website, we have a page for those who want to support donate food. And so here also is based on a zip code where you can search by zip code and we go back to Scotland County. In here, the timing is less relevant. We want to make it very easy where you can see everything in that area regardless of when they're offering the food. You can get in touch with them to donate your food, and you can also donate money through PayPal directly on the site. Thanks. And this also will have to be followed if you want to volunteer time and things like that. Okay. Thank you. So our next steps are going to engage with food providers and social workers. So what we want to do is, is make sure we validate this idea. So we're talking about what resources they're currently using. What are the gaps that might be in the functionality? Are there things we can add to the platform that can make it better, enhance it? What kind of problems are facing with what source they're using now? So that's the first thing. And then also get their information to help make it, make it accurate and better. Then we're going to spend some time further developing the site. Maybe we add some mobile functionality, add some mapping capabilities so they can find out where the food banks are from them. And lastly, we want to make sure we enlist support from local business and community leaders, like some of the people in this room, to make sure we have people who are behind us to really help make this reality and make sure that it can go forward and be really successful. And so in closing, I would like to present each of our judges with a stone. <laughs> and I would like to ask for this support in making the stone shoot that board a reality. Thank you for your time. <laughs> So, so it could be either one. It could be the advocate if they go out to the site to find help for the people they're working with, or it could be the person who just needs food and doesn't maybe even have a social worker. They can go to the site, or it could be people, restaurants, whatever, who have food to donate. They can go to the site and find out, hey, I've got access food. Who do I call? Where do I get this food? Like, uh, if it's going to be the person who actually is in need of food, I think that's something that we gave a lot of thought to. Um, the idea was we bring the data together it has a lot of value to make it accessible to whoever it is that's advising that person. So some people that don't have access to food do have a smartphone. We know this that age is a stronger predictor than poverty level. Um, but also we have social workers who are going out to their homes or when they're in the hospital to work with them. And that social worker can pull out their mobile phone and say, on Tuesday, you go down the street and here's where we have food available for you. And so we wanted to build a platform first, then we need to work on how do we reach the people that need it the most. Did you guys show this to any customers or any users who on the street or any restaurants in the area? So we have not done that yet, but that's, that's our plan is to make sure we're, we're meeting their needs. I do think that we were lucky that we had three people from Wake County and our team on the group with, in the room with us. And so we had some people who were very familiar with this space who worked with social workers and can kind of give us their opinions just based on their work experience. So the, uh, the data that you showed for the, uh, the different food banks, was that populated by you? Was that part of the open data that you grabbed? Or? So we were able to grab the data you saw today. We were able to grab from existing websites. We found several different sites which try to aggregate some food bank data, but it tends to be local and scattered and very non-user friendly. So we grabbed that from existing sources, cleaned it up, and populated it for a select portion of our data. And then for the analysis of the front end, we used the data from the portal to identify that the food insecurity was actually really big. There's other things I've looked at as well. That was a good predictor, and it was also something that we could action either way. So this site, if I have food bank and the information is not on your site that I find you, will I be able, as a food bank administrator, to submit my data on the site? Or? Yeah, that's right now we don't have that functionality up yet. But we'd like to have a form page where you can go in and say, add me to your site. We'll just have a free form we can fill out. We'll also have a contact us button where somebody is not comfortable uploading their own details and get in touch with us to discuss how to make sure they're included. And then it's also the functionality we want, we want to connect with them in different ways to say, hey, we have this thing, go out there, check out your information, make sure it's valid. I don't know if you have time to notice, but there's a little box at the bottom that says what services you provide, so you can change what services you offer. And then on the support us page, there was a thing that said needs. 
sort of name change. What what do you need? What are the top things? Maybe you're short on beans or whatever. So he said, that's what I really need, and you can change that over time. So we like to have constant contact with those people to make sure that's accurate. Good question. Uh, we have run a pretty good size student service agency. This is this is a, a good problem to solve. I think um, even here in Lake County, it's hard to get your arms around um, what the sources of food are and how, how to direct people because it's an ever changing landscape. So one of the challenges is finding that aggregated data to plug in. So the whole thing doesn't. Become grassroots and organic. Maybe do you all see that as a possibility or do you think that it, it is going to be you know, 90, 95 percent user input on um, uh, identifying the source of the food? Well, so, I, I, and, and I'll let Dave jump in, but, but I think it's a mix, right? Because there is a lot of data out there and it's, it's perfectly accurate because it has the address and location. I think what we're asking for the, the uh, Food, food providers to do for us is to, to vet their information. We don't expect all of them to have to do for it. We just maybe say, hey, check out the site, make sure it, it has what you need to be scraped this data from somewhere. We just want to make sure it's accurate. But certainly there's going to be some who need to input it because they're not readily available, they're new, whatever that case may be. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. That's the problem we found. There is data out there, but it's not aggregated in one source. That's exactly what we're trying to solve. And so we can do the work on the front end first of finding out where are the repositories of data now, how do we use whether scraping those, downloading those, cleaning them, and then put them into our data set, or just getting in touch with the right stakeholders who may have a paper list somewhere, um, and then empowering people to have input and update their data as they want to. But actually, what you're saying, we don't want to make it difficult, we don't want to make it hard for them to do it, so we'll take what's out there, but if, if you want to check it and just augment it, then we can support that as well. We see a lot of opportunities once you bring the data together. You can look at maps and see where are their food banks, where is their good distribution, where is their overlap, and where is their lack of distribution. So once you have that data, it becomes very powerful. Also, gifts to the judges. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for being so soon.
we think about our market, uh, we've talked about being local to the struggle to China. Um, and there are a couple uh, groups that we think we uh, we focus our, our marketing efforts on initially. Those would be seniors uh, and uh, non seniors who are seeking new positions. Uh, so, a senior group, uh, we can buy some specific strategies to try to engage those folks uh, to, to try to have a uh, more uh, And everybody else uh, seeking new positions in you know, these groups, these are people like pediatric therapy services, uh, folks who have relocated to town, uh, and other groups uh, where we know folks are. Uh, a little bit new providers. Uh, so we, we can tar target our marketing efforts towards, uh, towards that. And uh, we also know that there's a pet competitor to the market, plenty of websites out there where we can post reviews and get some information about positions. Uh, we, we recognize that none of these sites are taking uh, publicly available data, presenting it in meaningful ways, uh, data around quality and around cost. Uh, these sites, while well, you can get reviews, uh, there's very little information about providers that are in your local market. Um, if you were to go to check it out, it would be great. And lastly, uh, health and business. Uh, so, best of ideas around uh, monetization, uh, offering premium services, uh, using blue up data to allow uh, our platform to create analytics based on personal health information, uh, which we would store uh, in here. Uh, but I think most importantly, we would be generating a very rich data set around preferences for patients. Uh, in the local market, uh, how folks are rating providers uh, and trends and activities in that regard. That's, that's valuable information that uh, health systems and insurance carriers and uh, public agencies know that's be uh, hopefully interested in partnering with us uh, to deliver.
try to use the open data sources that we have. Um, but I think that there's plenty of opportunity around pharmacy, uh, especially in terms of cost and, uh, and education procedures as well. Um, but we get them here uh, and, and use it as kind of top of that information. Those opportunities, I think, will come uh, in terms of the business. Yeah, I mean, it's primarily, uh, your question is really valid since uh, VA is, has set up its own formulary and its own pharmacy practices for the VA patients. And we are expecting the trend would be going towards the additional markers as well. And once that market would be available, the data would be available immediately and we would be incorporating since there is a lot of uh, maturity which would be going based upon the data availability and we are seeing the trend actually. And, yeah. Do you think you're going to be able to get cast the hurdle where all sweet data is actually showing you true costs from the physician versus an aggregated profile of the client's insurance. That's the challenge. Yes. I think it requires uh, what, we, what we have in the data is is charges. We know the charges don't necessarily equate to cost, right? So Medicare is related to people's insurance and right. like the profile of those and that's, and I think that that's, that we did discuss this. I think that being able to uh, personalize this a little bit more, allowing folks to uh, pull in information about their insurance plan, compare that to, you know, the charge information that we have uh, can help determine costs. And we originally started, started off thinking, you know, we would focus this on Medicare patients only, but, but cost is really an issue for them. I mean, they're, they're basically, you know, there's very small differences in terms of what they're going to pay out of pocket uh, based on, on, you know, some different variables in the way that uh, Medicare and the billing works. Uh, but for those folks that are on private plans, there's, there's a lot of differences. And we think that if they understand those differences, we can incorporate that. If they analyze against that, yeah. those plans, that would be true. Yeah, and I think that's, that's information gathering. And it, it, it's about building relationships, I think, with local carriers. And I think that, again, we can prove to, to the marketplace that this is valuable build those relationships with better information for individual carriers. And even understanding who takes what insurance plans is, is not publicly available information. So we have to work with carriers with that. So. A, lot of <laughs> <laughs> A lot of providers are not either. Okay. okay. Thanks very much, local med advisor. I got I think this stuff the opportunity is awesome. <laughs> So there's one vote. All right, so uh, we'll bring up team on time, uh, on time care, and uh, fit name. Uh, you will be next, so you can make your way to the left deck here.
So that's what we've been working on this weekend. Um, it's actually a giant problem. Um, the average ER wait time in America is 55 minutes. Um, in a lot of, uh, especially urban areas, it's even longer than that. Um, this is driven by a lot of factors. Uh, one of the biggest is uh, non-emergent utilization of uh, the emergency room. So people could be better serviced, uh, a lot cheaper, um, and a lot quicker at a, uh, at a urgent care or another outpatient facility. Um, as many as a third of emergency room cases um, are not emergent. Um, okay, well, what are you going to do about this? Well, <laughs> that's interesting because what we're working on this weekend is an integrated solution uh, to make it really simple for people uh, to find the appropriate facility um, and to be, be quickly directed uh, to that facility. Um, so it's just, tell us your condition, we'll tell you the quickest, closest uh, provider based on their wait time and their travel time um, and how to get there. And then we'll process that information, and push it out to that provider so they will uh, know you're coming and have some of, the uh, some of your information to uh, make it quicker on their intake process. Absolutely. Um, so, what is the Well, there's a few different things from the provider side. Um, there's a few different applications we've developed. Uh, the, the piece of information that we need on the provider side is an accurate uh, estimation of their wait time. Um, providers make this information available whenever possible. Uh, you can find it on many websites, uh, even billboards on the side of the highway. Uh, some of you have uh, a tool where you can pull out the board. So uh, what we'd like to do is provide an interface uh, that they can quickly and easily give us uh, that wait time, or we can scrape it from wherever available uh, to calculate um, your wait time for whatever provider you need. Uh, a, a, a bigger integrated solution would be where we could calculate uh, the wait time based on the queue of patients that we have sent to this ER or urgent care provider, um, as well as uh, patients that are come and walked in through their, uh, through their door. So the solution that we are talking about, is the benefit side, um, you're saying you can increase the wait times by basically make less paperwork when a, when a, when a, when a patient arrives with an attend care and emergency good, he doesn't have to fill out a lot of forms. That profile has been sent to the provider on the of this app, and they have to just go and pick up his time slot on yesterday's walk-in and visit the doctor. Don't worry about the, all the other hassles. And that improves the uh, patient satisfaction, and basically, the, the, this data gets collected a lot of it, and you know, we want to do something about the analytics, help the, help the uh, facilities to better organize or better put it in place where there's a lot of needs rather than not a place where it's like overcrowded or things like that. So, how it works? So, we're going to the next slide. Um, so, talking about an integrated solution where there's a real time data coming to the uh, mobile app telling about uh, where the uh, urgent care and the emergency rooms that are the emergency care that are available and it's taking the real time data from the provider and, um, and passing on to the app. So it's it's basically very intuitive where you know you just pick up the phone and say that you know I need to go these are my pre very simple information where you enter your existing conditions and it pops up on a web page with the map saying that it's your closest day to them. Less wait time over the level of the you know, all these uh, different attacks where you do the uh, intake analysis and training. We provide insights to the providers and we also analyze the uh, ratings that users give about the different facilities. Moving on to the, what we want to do next. So we think there's a lot of opportunity to, to partner um, with some of the other uh, stakeholders in this. Um, some of the bigger stakeholders obviously are the patients who don't want to wait. Um, they want to get to the facility that's going to serve them the quickest um, and be up to the quality service that they need. Uh, uh, the, the facilities themselves often own many uh, 
ERs or urgent cares or outpatient facilities. Um, so they have an interest in driving patients to uh, to the proper facilities, to the closest facilities to their house, and uh, to, to spreading demand uh, amongst their facilities so they can more easily service that demand. Um, the third stakeholder, I believe, is the insurance companies. Um, payers have a strong interest in uh, avoiding unnecessary uh, uh, emergency care. Um, so there's going to be a lot of money saved um, by, by letting users easily recognize that their uh, condition can be treated at an urgent care or another outpatient facility that they get. Um, so from a development standpoint, and how we use actually some of the data is to, to try to target communities um, where we think wait times are the worst, uh, where there's least access to emergency rooms and um, urgent care. Uh, next piece is uh, continue with the, with the UI and the app. We want to work with both um, patients uh, and the providers to make this app as, as light and as easy to use as possible. Um, now obviously, in an emergency situation, uh, people, people don't want to go in their phone. Um, but if you're a town or if you are in a, a non emergent situation, um, you can maybe use this to, to more accurately uh, judge your care. Okay. I would like to call upon the team, Samantha and Abhishek, to work with us. So, all of the 55 minutes average week and what percentage of time is set for each of you? Um, we have did a few interviews at the different urgent cares, uh, and it, it turned out to be an average of 15 to 20 minutes where they, they take the intake process with a lot of uh, paperwork and ask them to sit in a lobby. But what we are trying to address is uh, where we don't want a patient to walk into a urgent care and sit in a lobby where they can better manage the time to actually walk into the uh, uh, provider at the right time, knowing the wait times ahead of it. <clears throat> I was just struck by the fact that the local med advisor across the arm of high care would be a good plan to say that you know, <laughs> you don't have a light because you want to actually be cured at the end of the day. So, <laughs> so but uh, I think the question I had is have you considered, what I'm concerned about, you know, concern about is not the average wait time over the last year, but what is happening on Saturday evening when I actually go have spent money in the house? So, is there a part being given to sourcing information from people who are actually sitting in the waiting room to inform you? Um, so, you're, you're talking about the actual demand that uh, we're, we're being Actual wait time, right now. Yeah, one of the key challenges in, in the whole application that we have seen is that, like, how does. So, there, there are a lot of existing facilities which publish the wait time. They have their own algorithm of finding out the wait time and publish it. Um, we want to start with a simple application where we want to give it to the provider to basically just enter the existing wait time that they have at that at their facility. It's very interesting where we have seen people writing on a whiteboard that this is the wait time. So we want to ask them to just enter that number in a simple interface and what we give it in behalf of that is these are the people heading to your place with these conditions, and they can be better prepared with what they want. But the next step for that is where you want to integrate this system. Use this as your now scheduling applications, where it's the wait time. It has a complete list of the people who are sitting in the lobby as well as people coming online. So that's the next step where we want to take it with them because it's very tough to get into the provider space and ask them to be use a big giant application where there's a lot of stuff. You want to start with very simple and start um, knowing the value of it. So that. I was just asking if you have a cross question. Um, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, we, uh, this works with the Google Maps API. So we used uh, provider addresses um, that we sourced from um, uh, Medicaid data, like one of the data sets that's available, um, target first roads to people that are working cares. Uh, the other source is we used uh, some CDC data um, to try 
not target counties uh, that had the longest wait times and the, the, uh, the biggest challenge um, with service from uh, ERs. We actually went through a few urgent cares over the weekend and interviewed people coming out of it. So we wanted to take the snapshot of the whiteboard, but the clinics did not allow us. So we had to wait, <laughs> we had to wait outside. And when people came out, we took interviews of them, asking them what was their wait time and how much time did they spend. And we did ask them and share our idea with those folks which came out of the facility, asking them if a solution like this is available, would you use it? They were willing to use it and they said, so we want to keep it very simple when the networks need to have it and see where we can enter minimum information. We have your profile out of here. And it gives the best uh, available option with the ranking, it gives the wait time and the distance. But because that gives you the direction, all the information has been sent to the profile that we just bought. And it is real time, so it keeps giving an alert if the, if the appointment is coming late or maybe the expansion for the facilities is uh, they can uh, expand their facility to more, have more equipment rather than having a long waiting room and they can utilize that space for getting more uh, uh, extra room or something else. <laughs> yeah. I think we think it's a, it's, a, it's a really big and expensive problem that can be solved right now with you know, existing data, and it seems that all parties um, really have a business financial interest in having this
sent out to some trades that we knew and said, hey, what's the number one way? And they said, what's going on? We put it out to the tip slip out of corner. And as we said, no more crime running out for the crime clients. You know, also, of course, the goal is to retain these clients. You know, and also, it like, helps them achieve results. That's the ultimate goal. So everyone, so they everyone. But the thing is, how can we bridge this gap? How can we bring these two groups together so that everyone can ultimately achieve whatever they're trying to achieve, whether it's making money or they get in shape? So our solution is FitMate. Is uniting fit seekers with their FitMate. So what is FitMate? It's an online tool that unites fit seekers with a wide range of personal trainers. This tool allows us to create more efficient, effective, and more desirable fitness relationships by evaluating purposes and training style. By identifying purposes, they allow clients to find trainers that fit, fit their needs, which will allow them to achieve sustainable long-term results. So, the tool. We have a few screenshots here that kind of make it a little more efficient so that we can make sure we stay within the time. So, first off, we'll sign in. So, welcome to your payment. You know, if you sign in, username, password. Step two, credit profile. You know, this is very important as far as the evaluation process. You know, you put your, you know, basic information, your name, your address, and contact information, but also your fitness health profile. You know, what's your last physical, um, you have any health concerns, things like things of that nature to help you better match up to a fitness trainer. Step three, matching, of course. You know, you have to move your, your list of, you know, bad dude, domino, chaos, you know, the seriously motivated ripped dude that can get you in shape. You know, but which one is best for you? You have that, that indicator saying, what is the best match? So you click on view trainer, you know, of course, you know, Joe Sixpack, best trainer in the area, seems like the best fit for you based on, you know, your purpose and what you like. Of course, now you got to work out. You know, you just schedule an appointment and say, all right, all right, we're, we're acting on it. We're trying to get in shape. Step six, the trainer review. Now, this is what's the thing that I thought was very important was uh, the, the evaluation process. A lot of times in the industry, you don't really get a lot of feedback on your service. You know, I mean, think about it. It's pretty awkward as a client to go into a trainer, I don't want to work out with you because you're not fun, you're too lean. But oftentimes, the next trainer that comes up that often that knows why that trainer was good because they say, you know, I really had a bad experience, he was really mean. You know, but I think it's very important as far as the learning process because if, if the trainer can't get better, they're not aware. So that's one thing where we want to implement, implement a reprocess which you got through your experience so that the trainers can constantly learn. We actually constantly learn and improve your, your matching process because we know what people like and what they so the business model, I guess we can actually continue on with you today. Okay, so the business model. So we have two customers. We have clients seeking service, so they're looking for guidance and quality service and results. But we also have trainers, and they're looking for um, for us to contribute revenue to their business because they need a match to run their business. They need to build their schedule. So um, we're creating value for both trainers and clients. So um, we have all these registered trainers. We have all these registered fit seekers. Um, so we have these trainers, they're able to register for free, and then they have a match. So say a person is decide they like six, Joe Six Pack, they'll get a notification saying, hey, you have a match. Do you want to act on it? So um, this potential client at $50 a session two times a week for three months, that's about the $1,200 value. We're saying, hey, pay $20 for this client, and, um, you know, maybe this is, we think it's the best match for you, and you got to continue to have a long-term business but beyond that, um, we think we can have value long term. So we have a basic membership, um, maybe thirty dollars a month for unlimited matches. We're always trying to build your schedule because that's what that's what personal trainers want. Um, and then a premium membership is um, fifty dollars a month. We have matches, scheduling, and the review process to help you retain your business, get better. Because they're two rules: you want to be good at what you are, you want to stand out, and then you want to make sure you're right. So um, our rollout strategy um, key partner again is independent personal trainers. Um, gyms, healthcare providers, you know, again, there's the obesity epidemic. We want to identify those people that are seeking trainers, and then this is a tool for them to access trainers to help them um, get better. Um, and then open source data, um, we use that to kind of identify our target market. market. So we have I looked at the Wake County Community Health Needs Assessment, and there are 10% of people do not engage in physical, physical activity. Therefore, 90% people do at some level. So we're trying to tap into those people. Um, and then, you know, there's an open source of parks and recreation and independent personal trainers, they can get out of their gyms and access parks and recreation facilities that are available to them easily. Um, so the future, um, there are in the nationwide 270,000 fitness trainers in the U.S. and it's growing, um, average growth. So there are always new trainers entering the 
market and they're looking for clients. And it's hard because it's word of mouth and you know proving your 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 service is high quality. Um, we want to improve results in the fitness industry. Having that feedback process is important. That's how people learn. That's how we get better. That's how we have better fitness results as a whole, as a, as a nation, as a community. And then um, we're just generating data to better understand clients and personal trainers. There's a gap in research to understand what motivates continuing years to lifestyle change. So we believe that everyone has a fitness. I just wonder if you could expand a little bit on that, that last point. So, if, if I, as I understand the business model that you're describing here, um, there's basically a fee associated with capturing the uh, lead for the trainer. Uh, the degree to which that's a valuable proposition for the trainer is probably related to the lifetime value of yeah. that particular right. client. And obviously, that's related to things like behavioral change. Right. And, and yep. Just wondering if what your thinking has been in terms of how you think what you're providing to be able to assist in that ongoing engagement process that can drive that, not only the economic value of the trainer, but the development of the organization as well? Um, well, as far as like, you know, as far as my background, you know, I, I've been around this industry for a long time. Including my mom, she's a personal trainer for 20 years. You know, one thing I realized that people fail to realize that with, with personal trainers, a lot of it's based on relationships. Know, whether or not you get along, you know, you know, what type of motivate you. Like for example, like I'm very competitive. I prefer someone who will push me to my limit because I'm very competitive. I will compete with them. But somebody on the flip side who's not very competitive, who can hit a play sports growing up or something like that, maybe first of all a little more supportive and more of a fully action saying, hey, you, you can do it, you can do it. Man. You know, so I feel like that has a big bearing on people continuing and going off to the next step and saying continue on to all turn. So that's kind of one thing that we're trying to address as far as like, you know, you may, you know, when you look at the gym, when you look for a personal trainer right now, a lot of times you say, okay, I'm going to go to my local gym, and they're probably going to first person available. And so you talk to them, and they're probably going to say you want it, and we'll see if it works out. But one thing we're trying to, we're trying to, like, alleviate the unknown variable of whether or not this is a good fit for you. And I want you to understand it is a personalized match for you as to you achieve your goal and sustain that long term. Yeah, and the feedback is very important because we have our theories of what will make a good match, but there's no data. Like I've done like behavioral change post health research, and there's no data saying what individuals want and what's that going to keep them sustained. There's a general saying, you know, you need friends to support you, but there's nothing saying what in their individual circumstances is going to make them continue. So we're trying to generate some of that data based on feedback to get that. Yeah. Get that because it's, it, it's not it's not clear. Yeah, and that also continues on to our future part. Like we are trying to, you know, with the review process, and we have like we haven't really continued. I mean, we have a complete uh, questionnaire on the top and bottom. But one thing we want to do is use that data over time and understand like what is that that gets people to continue on with this training? What is it that is is it you know training style? Is it likes dislikes? You know, we don't know because like she said. We, we, and it was like, okay, there's nothing concrete saying this is what motivates you. This is what you're saying. So that's one thing that motivates and inspires us to do is because we want to create a tool that allows us to figure out that, that answer. So the word open data is to be used for this. Open data? Oh, so I mean, I looked at the community health needs assessment, just kind of understanding what are the health behaviors of the community, and we feel like that would inform kind of target markets to see what. Wake County, obviously, like the most closely county in North Carolina and stuff like that. But understanding those kind of markets and maybe, you know, when people come to our sites, it could be a source of saying, hey, um, people in Durham, get on our, you know, contact a personal trainer so your your community gets better, you know. Um, and then we're looking at parks and rec data to understand, like, what are the resources to trainers to connect and um, have those results for this time. So just a thought, uh, since you mentioned you, there's no data available where we can be able to match what kind of uh, trainer or somebody is looking for. What is the success of match or not? Is something similar? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's was the, the, the inspiration was, in, in, in a sense. Like, we, you know, what I said about inspiration was like, you know, best.com, best.com. And then even LinkedIn, you know, we looked at, you know, when we were trying to figure out business models, like, what kind of things, how do they generate revenue as far as, you know, a network? But at the end of the day, we're trying to connect people. So, and that's one thing we kind of looked at. Like, like you said, you know, our original ideas was a lot of, uh, you know, like our 
degrees. It was a, we had like we had a very extensive um, kind of theory. system of theory to kind of figure out what it is that motivates people and get people to act on and just make this goal. But you know, it's, it's in for anybody this weekend. We're like, okay, we, we need to scale it down a little bit, figure out what is it we can do now, and then maybe it's something we can do right later on in the future. Maybe maybe we can't come up with something. Maybe you know, can no more problems. I don't know, but we got to let me. Okay. All right. I'm here to represent Iloqua. You can imagine a, a patient coming to a hospital with uh, pneumonia, but she's diagnosed with flu. She's discharged, and then within a week, she comes back, and she's diagnosed this time with pneumonia. Hospitals are being penalized. $227 million in 2013 um, for these kinds of readmissions. We went and talked to some doctors uh, and asked them if there might be some usability for a, uh, a recommender system, something that would help them diminish the amount of uh, uh, readmissions. So, this particular doctor, he said, you know, there's there's currently no quantified risk score out there for that could help us. So we could certainly use something that could give us some more advice uh, to help us with making judgments about these kinds of patients, whether they're a risk or a readmission. We asked them a number of other questions. We asked them things like, um, is, is readmission a problem for you? And 100% of them said yes. We spoke to four hospitalists in hospitals from 50 to 300 beds. Uh, we asked them what reasons, and they gave us a number of reasons specifically for uh, patients with pneumonia. We asked them, you know, are you concerned about reimbursement for those patients? And sure enough, 75% of them are concerned about getting money back for those, re for those um, readmissions. And 100% definitely said a recommender system is something they could use. So we are introducing health quality, better health by reducing readmissions. So Again, you can imagine patients coming to the hospital, they have um, a diagnosis, you know, the same diagnosis for influenza with other manifestations. Each of these patients um, has a different medical history, a different medical uh, medications history. And we have to figure out among these, which one is the higher risk for readmission. That's what we're, our system is going to do for these hospitals and doctors. So our system takes information from various different sources. It takes open, um, open data from uh, census county data. It can take open data from 
um, CMS and hospital data, um, as well as medical history um, and medications history from CMS. And then it takes uh, information from the hospitals, various different kinds of information that we need, and uses that information for predictive analytics. And with that analytics, it produces a result which comes out as a dashboard for those doctors and hospital administrators. And this is an example of what um, a doctor's dashboard might look like. So here in this case, this would be, you know, for John, you can see that his, his risk score is, is 1.5 and, you know, on the meter, you can see that he's, he's in the green, so we don't have to worry about him too much. Um, if, if John was more um, higher up on that scale, maybe we have to be more concerned about what to do about that particular patient. So, we, and we might be curious about where that number came from. Maybe we want to check to make sure that, you know, they know what they're doing. And so we actually have a feature here where you can click on this and you can find out how we came up with that score so the doctor can find that information out. Um, we also provide a doctor with a way to find out what should I do if my patient is going to, uh, is, is a high risk. Each patient is going to have a different kind of way to react to that patient. And we can provide them with specific actions that they would do in order to react to that particular patient. We also provide some additional information they can click down to you know, find out more about that patient. And we provide information that, that maps this patient across various different other uh, categories that that patient might fall in. For instance, which socioeconomic class they're in and how they map with regard to those factors. <clears throat> so behind this dashboard is the analytics which comes up with some clarity about um, where these patients are falling. So we can we use multiple variables that we can get from all this data that we can get off the internet, a lot of it being open data. Uh, and <clears throat> we, we determine you know, what classification these patients might be in and determine that risk score. And for instance, Jane um, is, is here, she's up in the high risk, and then John, as you saw before, is in the low risk. So we have a number of key partners. These are key partners related to the data. Um, we would be working with them to, to collect that open data, et cetera, um, and other kinds of information. <clears throat> and we've looked at the numbers. We can see that a readmission loss is uh, $4.4 million per year per hospital. If we just reduce that by 12%, we could save those hospitals enough money to pay for our product, which would, you know, uh, in the area of $500,000. Um, and the thinking is that within five years, we could sell maybe to 100 hospitals and generate revenues of about $50 million. We would focus on a particular uh, on those hospitals that are most uh, likely to have a problem and um, the rollout is that the feasibility study we would have um, would be funded with grant money, then we would uh, champion, develop a champion hospital, target that, um, target a marketing campaign towards those companies that have the most uh, need for this service, and once we've gotten that particular market, then we can roll it out more extensively. So thank you very much. This is our team. Uh, there was one point where you said that the, the, uh, the doctor or the hospital staff could dive into the direct recommended 1.5 risk factor. Right. Are you disclosing your kind of algorithm and analytics in that, in that process? Or? Not really. I mean, we're, we're giving them some more information about why, um, you know, how we came up with this particular number. But the algorithm would be a lot more complex for them to be able to figure out how, you know, we pulled that out of all the data we have. You know, we'd be doing this from, you know, 
historical data and we you know, have training data, et cetera, to come up with this information. And then each time we got a new patient, we'd be able to improve upon the, the predictive analytics, et cetera. So yeah, I don't think that that would give it away now. How much readmission is caused by misdiagnosis? And how much is caused just by the failure or client or patient to respond to medication, physical therapy, or some other kind of treatment? Yeah. Uh, sure. Actually, we had a survey uh, that we did. Uh, I'm not sure. Because I'm a little confused. I'm, I'm a little confused. What, what is the in uh, James case? If you'd seen a higher risk profile, you're saying that they should have, even though she she didn't show as a pneumonia patient at the time, they should have started treating her yeah. as such. So if you look without, at her profile, that show it. So if you look at her profile, she was diagnosed based on her medical history. She was diagnosed with pneumonia in 2013. So once the software would have access to that information, along and you have access to her claims information and her medication history. Based on that, it would be analyzing data and looking at the other risk factors that she would have in case she is a 70 year uh, Caucasian female. How, how would she, uh, how the software would place her in terms of her risk factors as, com as compared to the uh, other people in her uh, in a sector? Yeah. 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 That's going to ask. So, so there's a lot of reason for readmits. Uh, he has one there on a specific disease state. Well, so we did think that pneumonia was a major issue, and it, it's a fairly simple one, I think, to, to deal with. Um, but that would require some research and some investigation, you know, more investigation. I spoke to four doctors. Okay, um, certainly it would help a whole lot more to do a lot more research on on the customers and, and what their particular needs are and where the biggest issues are and how most easily to impact them. So. And, and if I could just add one point over here. So the new Affordable Care Act, it has a section 3025 actually that requires, and that has identified three categories that uh, hospitals are penalized right now. And pneumonia is one of the category, I think other is heart failure and heart uh, attack. So, so there is an incentive for hospitals to address those right away because it is financial penalty for them. And obviously there are other reasons for other, uh, other diseases that are coming up. I think you already in the horizon, but they are already it's starting to implement penalty for people right now. So those would be the best places to park. I have a question about your price point and the cost of Sorry. Um, so these numbers are coming right off the, uh, you know, our research to, you know, where they've actually documented this information. So uh, a lot of this is CMS information, right there. Okay. So, so this is valid information. And seven hundred hospitals in five years. Um, I, I think it is. Um, I really think that over time you could expand. So in the first year, you know, you grow a small number, maybe two or three, but within a fairly quick time, you could you could expand the organization to do one hundred hospitals. This is a, a major problem, and hospitals are you know wanting to look for solutions. And I think that if you don't suck, if you don't become a major provider like this, um, there will be other competitors out there that could potentially over your space. So you've got to ramp up fairly quickly. So this would be dependent upon how much money you could put into marketing and promotion. I didn't hear what you were saying. The hospital sales cycles are pretty long, six months, eight months, three, four months, maybe inside the hospital. Right. I think it is five years is time frame that we're talking about. I mean, in five years, all of the hospitals have um, been developing electronic health records and that compared to a $500,000 purchase, those were, some of those were, um, you know, $300 million purchases. And you talk about sales cycles, those were the short, were amazingly short sales cycles compared. So 
I think, you know, when it comes to the kind of the dollars we're talking about that saving, they're shortening their life cycle. And one key component, uh, one key component of our rollout strategy is to partner with the Champion Hospital, Tom has mentioned. So once you call up the relationship, because as you know, this, this is a predictive analytics, which would require a lot of data feedback so that it can find units out and produce better results as, as more data is being passed. So that's why we have to partner with hospitals beginning to champion it and then uh, target to other Okay, thanks very much to you. So let's give all the attendees, all the presenters. I am so, uh, while I take the uh, judges back to chambers to deliberate, um, feel free to uh, network. I think there's still some snacks. Uh, but another good potential thing to do might be to go clean up your space and pack your stuff because after we're uh, done with the awards presentation, uh, we'll be headed over uh, shortly after that uh, to the after party at Five Star down uh, Hammond Street. So uh, prepare for that. We'll be back with the, uh, the winner's announcements in a moment. Thanks.